Okay. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this edition of the Monty Heart Cardiology Lecture Series. Today, we're extremely fortunate to have Dr. Ulrich Yorty presenting on the treatment of advanced heart failure, and more specifically, SGLT2 Arnie and heart failure before, before device therapy, sine qua non. Dr. Yorty, uh, as a way of introduction, graduated from Hamburg Medical School, Germany in 1991, and subsequently completed his internal medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in Manhattan and cardiology fellowship at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. In 1999, he joined the heart failure and transplant faculty at Columbia University. And from there in 2003 to 2005, he directed the heart failure program at New York University. He returned to Columbia University in 2007 as medical director of the Mechanical Circulatory Support Program and was uh, appointed um, the rank of professor at an uh, extremely young age at Columbia before us being very, very, very fortunate to recruit him here in 2014 where he was named section, section Chief of Heart Failure, Mechanical Circulatory Support and Cardiac Transplantation, as well as Vice Chief of Cardiology. His academic record is really, really, really remarkable. He's had research funding from the NIH in the form of a K-23 and R01. He's been the primary mentor for multiple K-23 and has also had American Heart Association funding. He has also published over, and this is not a mistake, over 240 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals. He currently serves on the board of directors of the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation and is an internationally sought after speaker. I will say from my perspective, what we've noticed here at Montefiore is that since his arrival, we've had remarkable, remarkable growth of the heart failure program. And we are now recognized as one of the largest in terms of clinical and academic productivity in the field. On a uh, very personal level, and I think all of his faculty will agree on this, that he is an unbelievable mentor, really taking the time to help us each come up with our own path, clinically, academically, in a way that you don't find too often in medicine, he helps us incorporate that into our personal lives. And I think we all very much appreciate him for that. And uh, with that, I'm going to let him start, um, Uli. Great. Thanks, Neil. Um, thanks for the introduction. Welcome, everybody. I would like to underscore the extremely young age uh, from this introduction. So um, usually I would give uh, a lecture uh, on uh, mechanical support or cardiac transplantation, uh, as you see here in our brochure from our very large and excellent team of um, many disciplines, surgeons, cardiologists, infectious specialists. But uh, today uh, I would like to uh, underscore that uh, over the past uh, seven years, our team really has uh, dramatically evolved on the medical side. And uh, we now have a total of 11 uh, transplant cardiologists, heart failure cardiologists with multiple different interests, ranging from uh, material medicine, digital health, pulmonary hypertension, cardiac transplantation, sarcoid, non-invasive uh, measurement of filling pressures, critical care, l physiology, amyloid, and bleeding diathesis in um, elevated patients. So a very uh, broad program. We have also um, expanded our reach. We now have uh, active clinics uh, on all Montefiore sites in the Bronx, but also uh, are about to open a hospital center at Nyack Hospital. And I believe some of the Nyack uh, team is online today. Uh, we see patients uh, at White Plains Hospital and we really become, uh, I think the program to cover the entire health system, uh, including a Montefiore transplant outpost on Long Island at St. Francis uh, Medical Center. We see about 10,000 outpatients annually, 10,000 inpatients are very active in clinical trials. This team has performed over 500 heart transplants and we're the only bloodless uh, program in New York and also a very large number of left ventricular assist devices. But I want to leave it there uh, for the heart replacement therapy and really focus on what is much more important in heart failure, uh, anything uh, that we can do to avoid uh, the patient to reach uh, advanced stages with nowadays is very much possible. So my goals today 
uh, to explain to you the number needed to treat just to understand the clinical trials better, update you on pharmacological therapy of HEFREF in 2021, introduce you to the emerging field of percutaneous valve therapy and valvuloventriculoplasty in heart failure, and then uh, have an open discussion at the end on how we can uh, serve uh, the system better. But let me first uh, explain to you the extremely uh, important number needed to treat. Easily calculated, 100% divided by the absolute difference. So for example, if you have 200 patients uh, with COVID, 100 get steroids, 100 with placebo, 30 die in the placebo group, 20 in the steroid group, then the absolute difference in survival is 10%. 100 divided by this difference is 10. So you need to treat 10 patients to save one life. <clears throat> Another example closer to home, fortunately, nowadays, is you have 200 patients with STEMI. 100 get a stent, 100 don't. 15% die in the stent group, 30% in the other group. The absolute difference is 15%. 100 divided by 15 is 7. So you need to treat 7 patients to save one life. One more example with defibrillators. 200 patients have an EF of less than 35%, 100 get them ICD, 100 don't, 30 die in the ICD group, 35 in the other group, absolute difference is 5%, 100 divided by 5 is 20, so treat 20 patients to save one life. Very important to take into account what you actually have to do to accomplish this. In case one, you treat the patients for one week with steroids and you wait 30 days to save the life. In the stand case, you treat for in skilled hands for 10 minutes and then wait six months. In the ICD case, you treat for two hours and then wait five years. Not that ICDs are not important, but you have to see uh, the differences in the acute treatment versus a long-term treatment. So in heart failure, uh, until recently, I would say, uh, not much change over over 20 years. Introduction of ACE, ALDO, and beta blockers reduced the mortality in heart failure from a one-year mortality of 54%. This is what I call nature. This is called HEFREF patients, class four, treated with Lasix and Tudroxin in the consensus trial. Neither medication modifies uh, survival. ACE, beta blocker, ALDO added, and uh, when you do this, the same group of patients will have a one-year survival of 90%. So you can now, with an absolute reduction of about 50%, calculate the number needed to treat properly or not at all, is only two to save one life. Nowadays with uh, generic medications. That is the power uh, of medical therapy. But importantly, I wanna update you today as things have changed, I would say almost dramatically. The first example is the introduction of um, Entresto uh, into the market. You can see here the typical New England Journal of article uh, figures, the curve separate a little bit, but let's calculate the number needed to treat. When you look at the combined endpoint of cardiovascular death or admission for heart failure, the difference between the treatment group with Entresto 22% and the inalapril group 27% is about uh, 5%. If we now calculate uh, the event uh, prevention, it is about 20, a number needed to treat 20 patients with Entresto versus Enalapril, you can switch them uh, and you will save a life. If you wanna prevent a heart failure admission, you need to treat uh, 33 patients. It might sound like complicated math. We look at this uh, from a bigger picture. What if we treat as a group, the group that I showed you before, our four to 5,000 patients in our clinics for two years and leave them on an ACE inhibitor or change them to Entresto. In that case, uh, just in our local hospitals here, we would uh, prevent 120 admissions, save 80 lives or 200 uh, of either of these events. So very important. What about starting uh, this drug in the hospital? Here's a follow-up study of patients with an EF of less than 40%, hospitalized with heart failure, and they were randomized to receive Enalapril or uh, Entresto in-house. And the primary endpoint of the study was a BNP reduction, which is an excellent surrogate of outcomes. And you can see in the graph here that with Sacupitril Varsatan, I prefer to say Entresto is much easier, 
uh, there was a highly statistically significant reduction in BNP levels. There were, however, more importantly and closer to the bedside, uh, pre-specified secondary endpoints, specifically the rehospitalization for heart failure in the first 30 days was pre-specified. You can see a difference between 8 and 14%. So a 6% absolute difference, and you can now uh, do the math and know that if you treat about 18 patients, you will save an admission. This is very good uh, for the patient who doesn't get readmitted and very good for uh, hospital finances and for the healthcare system. So um, is there a difference in the adverse event profile of these drugs? Absolutely. There were also significantly less serious uh, clinical events in patients who received uh, Entresto versus Inalapro. Another medication uh, recently introduced is very Siguat. It's essentially a, a pulmonary a vasodilator that enhances cyclic GMP. Very large study, EF less than 45%, heart failure less than six months ago, started as outpatients. And here, the combined endpoint of heart failure, hospitalization, or death was uh, reduced from 41% to 38%. So you need to treat 24 patients for 10 months to achieve this endpoint. This is also not trivial when you think about the millions of patients uh, that have heart failure in the United States. And very Sigurd was approved by the FDA uh, just a few months ago. So should we reach for this drug next? Uh, let's take a closer look at the Victoria trial and look at the background therapy. 60% of patients were receiving beta blocker MRAs or uh, Entresto, I'm sorry, um, ACE or ARP. Only 15% of patients, however, were on Entresto. Now that we know that there's a significant difference in outcomes between ANI and ACE or ARB, that's a little bit of a problem. There is no information on uh, the next drug I will discuss, the SGLT2 inhibitors, although 48% of these patients in this trial were uh, diabetic. So let's put a pin into this drug and move to um, the SGLT2 inhibitors. Extremely important medications nowadays in heart failure. And let's look at the DAPA-HF trial that was published uh, just a little over a year ago. And here again, you see a very large trial with almost 5,000 patients. And to cut to the chase here, when you look at the combined endpoint of uh, hospitalization or death from heart failure, there was an absolute reduction of about 5%. You add this medication to already an excellent background therapy and you will achieve a further reduction in hospitalization mortality. Now, importantly, this is traditionally a diabetes medication and 40% in each group, placebo group and DAPA group, had diabetes type 2. And when this was a pre-specified analysis, there was absolutely no difference in the efficacy of this agent or safety uh, between diabetic patients or non-diabetic patients. Type 1 diabetics were excluded. So this was the first trial that introduced the SGLT2 inhibitors to the heart failure world. And shortly to be followed by a second trial, this time uh, empaglifosin or Jardians and a long story short here, again, 3,500 patients results were essentially exactly the same in the same patient population. So I think it is fair to say at this point that there is a class effect of SGLT2 inhibitors in HFRAT, whether or not the patient has type 2 uh, diabetes. Now, I mentioned earlier in the Versugard study that um, the background therapy wasn't really up to speed. Uh, here in the DAPA heart failure sub-analysis, uh, you can see that in patients who were on ANI or not, meaning they were on ACE or ARB, there was no difference in the efficacy of dapaglifosin. So even if you are already on Entresto, dapaglifosin added further uh, in this study. This is a very important observation when we think about what drug should we reach for next among the recently approved drugs for heart failure. And of course, dapaglifosin is approved now. Uh, furthermore, SGLT2 inhibitors have been tested in chronic kidney disease. And if you treat patients with chronic heart failure, you know that this is rarely 
an isolated diagnosis and much more commonly comorbidities of diabetes or renal disease or COPD exist. So here is a study in patients with chronic kidney disease. Again, a very large study of 4,300 patients that had a reduced glomerular filtration rate and an abnormal albumin creatinine ratio. The primary endpoint for this study was either a 50% decline in the GFR, which is quite big, or the need for um, development, I'm sorry, of end stage renal disease or renal or cardiovascular death. And again, the um, dapagliflozin, the SGLT2 inhibitor, performed very nicely with an absolute difference of 5%. Again, you can do the math now by yourself on the 5%, treat 20 patients for 2.8 years, and you will avoid uh, end stage renal disease or a significant reduction in GFR, which, as you know, is associated with mortality in these patients. So when you reach for a drug in heart failure, in a patient who also has a renal disease, it is uh, very clear that we should use these agents. And at this point, since I haven't done it before, I want to make it even more clear that I have no conflict of interest whatsoever with any pharma, uh, pharma pharmacy company. What are the mechanisms? Uh, what are the cardiac effects of SGLT2? Um, there's some uh, things are known about this. Here is a, a mouse model uh, of an energy deprived heart. And you can see that the mouse here in this little yellow bar is not able to use glucose uh, properly. Uh, there's a 66% difference in glucose oxidation compared to a normal heart. You can see that free fatty acid oxidation seems to be intact. And these mice are now treated with an SGLT2 inhibitor. They are on the right again, able to properly oxidize glucose and generate uh, ATP. And for those uh, who work with me closely, they know that I have uh, zero experience with mouse experiments. So let me rather move to uh, experiments in humans with heart failure that we have done uh, in the past. And here we look at circulating energy substrate during exercise in heart failure patients and what we demonstrated, if you look in the middle here, this is free fatty acid release during exercise. Uh, the left bar is heart failure patients without insulin resistance, and the middle bar is heart failure with insulin resistance. The right bar is diabetes, and you can see that heart failure patients seem to have an inability to release uh, free fatty acids. On the right, you can see that this free fatty acid release is strictly associated with uh, cardiopulmonary uh, exercise capacity. So there seem to be important differences in fuel metabolism that need to be uh, elucidated in the future. But at this point, I have to admit, since the clinical effect is so clear, uh, it, is, it is not uh, so interesting to me anymore. I am more interested in things that I'm more familiar with the loading conditions of the heart. And here, uh, interestingly enough, SGLT2 inhibitors have a very favorable effect on preload, afterload, as well as on interior stiffness and improve uh, ventricular loading conditions. This is something that as heart failure cardiologists will recognize. This is an important feature and actually uh, was the original treatment of heart failure uh, with just hemodynamic uh, improvement of vasodilator therapy. What has been observed with this agent is a reversal of adverse cardiac uh, remodeling, which is a very strong marker for future uh, clinical improvement. Here you can see a study from Japan. Uh, it's a small study, but a pioneering study in patients with heart failure, where the investigators demonstrated that left ventricular math and left atrial volume are decreased after treatment with, I believe, uh, dapagliflozin in this cage. Uh, importantly, most of these patients were patients with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, i.e. Uh, normal ejection fraction. And the trials I showed you before focus on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But very recently, in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, it was really an excellent study uh, from the group at Mount Sinai that looked at uh, in humans with heart failure, a randomized clinical trial comparing empagliflozin or Jardians uh, to placebo. And you can see here on the left, uh, the study protocol over six months, 
patients had blood samples for various tests, but had cardiac MRI and cardiac pulmonary exercise testing uh, at various time points throughout the trial. They started with 250 patients, ended up with 40 in each group. And you can see uh, when they compared the MRI data uh, on these patients compared to placebo, there was a very clear and highly statistically significant uh, signal, not signal, but uh, change in uh, cardiac math, cardiac size, so a very favorable effect on left ventricular remodeling by cardiac MRI, which is really the gold standard. This is a beautiful study if you haven't seen it in the um, in Jack. Now, why uh, did this medicine work? Uh, we don't really know yet, but very interesting what the uh, investigators reported here. And this is important uh, to us as clinicians. When you look at the empaglifosin group, there was uh, a reduction in loop diuretic in one out of three patients or so, whereas there was no reduction in the placebo group loop diuretic. And yes, these drugs have some diuretic effect, and there is some discussion as to whether this is maybe just another diuretic. Uh, I don't have time to go into this, but this is clearly not true. There are clearly effects that go uh, beyond uh, diuretic therapy here. So I showed you that in this trial, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors had a very significant effect on uh, remodeling and heart failure. Uh, we know that from trials 20 years ago and more that the size of the heart for remodeling, how much the heart is remodeled is closely associated with very important outcomes such as death. And in fact, uh, when we look at earlier studies with pharmacotherapy and heart failure, we have seen that again, if you use mouse models and you create an infarct, the pressure volume curves will change. In essence, they get bigger. And if we treat these mice with uh, an ACE inhibitor for several months, the heart will get smaller again. This shift here from left, from, from this dashed line to the solid line is the reverse remodeling. And there are many trials in heart failure with many agents and some of them pacemaker trials what is very clear is that if your intervention makes the heart smaller as seen here in the left lower square, you will have a favorable effect on long-term outcomes. And I wanna kind of rub this in now that from the pharmacotherapy we have learned the early signal for any therapy is whether uh, adverse reverse remodeling occurs, whether the heart gets uh, smaller. Here is a demonstration of this, a reduction in the ancestolic volume index and a reduction in circulating uh, pro-BNP. Groups in the Valiant study, a very large study here in red that have both these things have very few events over the next years compared to other patients who do not see a shrinking, if you will, uh, of the heart. So how do we operationalize uh, these therapies and the introduction of these therapies in our daily practice? If we're not just doing uh, investigations and research. Here's what we do uh, on the main campus at Montefiore. We have uh, a fellow review uh, the patient's charts before they arrive. And if my patient for some reason is not on say a beta blocker, I will receive an email uh, a kind email that asked me to either consider re-shelling with my patient with an efficient medication or document in the chart appropriately that my patient cannot uh, take this medicine. And recently we have added the request to add an SGLT2 inhibitor for HEFREF patients uh, to this. Um, how can we accomplish this um, in our entire uh, healthcare system? And we're working very closely now on a, with administration and other partners at other hospitals, NIAC specifically uh, on a standardized approach for any heart failure admission where a diuretic uh, regimen that is effective and early and will lead to quick neurolemia is initiated. And where for those patients who do not have a primary cardiologist that have an EF of less than 30% or a large heart, or are refractory to initial therapy, a leapfrog consultation will occur 
uh, with a uh, heart failure cardiologist. Again, if there's no primary cardiologist, we also will be delighted to consult at the request of the primary doctor. Um, moving right along, uh, now the patient is in-house, has been properly treated. We need to make sure that the patient gets these medications while in-house, as it is often very difficult to start therapy once the patient has uh, gone home. Uh, I want to move away now, uh, having left you with, I think, the power of medical therapy to other strategies to induce uh, reverse remodeling. Uh, I focused until now until, on medical therapy that would do this, but there are also other ways to do this, specifically a physical restraint or valve therapies. I want to now go to a patient example. This is a patient uh, I saw about um, two years ago. This is a 54-year-old man who has uh, acutely compensated heart failure. He has a workup with normal coronaries. Uh, even those who are not uh, imaging experts would see that this patient has a terrible uh, ejection fraction, probably less than 20%. Uh, he did not have evidence of myocarditis, and he was on metropolar 50 milligrams only. So this is, uh, could be viewed uh, two ways. Uh, could be viewed, uh, this is a layup, uh, very easy to optimize this patient's regimen, or maybe we have missed the boat and it's too late now and we need to proceed to uh, have a therapy or transplantation. Please note that this patient also has a severe uh, mitral regurgitation. And to take a step back, uh, we have to analyze what type of mitral regurgitation this is. And we generally differentiate between primary or degenerative versus functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. And you see a little cartoon here on the left, if you're not familiar with this, these are normal leaflets. Uh, they are co-apting uh, very properly. And if they are displaced somehow, uh, typically by annular dilation, this may lead to mitral regurgitation. This is very different from primary MR, where there essentially is something wrong with the mitral valve apparatus per se. This is a surgical disease. This is most likely a medical disease, for certain not a surgical disease. Uh, and how common is this? Why am I bringing this up in a what is a basic uh, heart failure treatment talk? So let me ask you a question. You admit 100 patients with acutely compensated heart failure and an ejection fraction of less than 50%, how many will have moderate to severe or severe functional, the valves are structurally intact, functional mitral regurgitation? You could say, I usually do not see this degree of MR, maybe 5% or less, about 20%. Or you say, actually, this is quite common. I see this in almost everybody who comes in with a severe volume overload. Well, uh, we took a look at this. Uh, Rajna Kataria, who is one of our uh, graduating fellows, uh, leaving us in July for um, Harvard to do a year of heart failure there. Uh, she looked at uh, almost 3,000 patients that had an admission with acute decompensed heart failure and looked for those that have uh, an ejection fraction of less than 50% and functional mitral regurgitation. And what she found is that of those 2,300 patients who didn't have other issues or primary disease, about 1,000 uh, did have no or only mild MR. But the other, a little over 1,000, had at least moderate MR. And in fact, 20% had moderate to severe or severe MR. So one in five patients with acutely compensated heart failure in our system had moderate to severe or severe MR. What is the consequence of this? Uh, this paper um, is our paper that we wrote uh, on this data is currently in review. And the consequence is that if you have severe MR uh, detected during the first 72 hours of your stay, uh, you come in like that. Uh, this actually has long-term consequences and clearly indicates that uh, you will have a higher likelihood of uh, readmission within six months on the right here, or even death uh, uh, on the left. So importantly, 
these patients uh, need to be paid close attention to and probably with a very early follow-up after uh, the heart failure hospitalization. But while in hospital, how can we uh, improve mitral regurgitation? Again, uh, you see here in the right upper corner, these are normal mitral leaflets. All the way to the left, you see a dilated annulus. And in the cartoon in the middle, you see that even in a normal heart, with normal mitral leaflets, I should say a dilated heart, if the patient decompensates and the heart gets bigger, what will happen is that the annulus dilates and now you have uh, mitral regurgitation. Importantly, you can change this uh, while the patient is in your hands if you diurese them properly. Therefore, our new and more aggressive uh, diuresis protocol that I showed you earlier that should be employed in every patient like this. And this is not new data. This is historical data now from the last century in the late 90s of last year. It's a beautiful study. 14, at the time, I should say, 14 patients with HFREF severe MR, and they were given LASIK and vasodilators. And what you can see is they lost significant rate, the CVP went down, the wedge went down, the index went up. And very importantly, when you look at the echocardiogram, the actual physical dimension of the mitral annulus decreases. And this leads to a reduction in uh, functional mitral regurgitation. So reverse remodeling, you can achieve by simply giving a diuretic and reducing uh, mitral regurgitation. And this is exactly what we did in the patient that I showed you earlier. And the, the years are um, confused here. He actually was seen in 12, 2018 with a very large chart, 7.3 centimeters, you have 15% severe MR. And then three months later on follow-up echo, his heart had already reversed the model. The heart was smaller now. The EF was still terrible and he had uh, only mild mitral regurgitation. And now this patient has been set up for further reverse remodeling in the setting of appropriate medical therapy. This is the end result here at the time. SGLT2 wasn't on the market then. And again, even those of you that are not uh, expert echocardiographers will see that this is now a totally normal heart uh, on this medicine. Usually you would see a follow-up echo after transplantation. But I can assure you that this was just done uh, with proper medical therapy. And again, underscores the importance and power of uh, medical therapy. So for medical therapy, practice like it's 2021. The excellent results I have shown you can be achieved with medical therapy. Ani or Entresto or Sagupitrol Varsatan is clearly better than ACE or ARB for HFREP. In fact, there, in my opinion, is absolutely no place anymore for ACE inhibitors or ARBs, except for the patient where you're trying to start drug, they have very low blood pressure and you would like to start with a very low dose of losartan. Otherwise, these medications and HFREP have no indication anymore. And if your patient is on those, and you're not changing it, uh, you're depriving the patient basically of a uh, event, less event uh, future. SGLT2 inhibitors should be given to everybody uh, with HFRA. And now with these dramatic uh, results, I could just stop here. Um, but I do want to answer the question whether we still need uh, device therapy uh, in heart failure in the next uh, 30 minutes that we have. Uh, so let's have a reality check. Not all uh, ventricles improve, not all MR goes away. And a more common scenario for us would be that if we had treated this patient with diuresis and guided medical therapy, the F would get better, but it would not normalize. That would get smaller, but it would not get normal. And the patient might remain symptomatic. And in fact, the patient may be left with moderate to severe functional mitral regurgitation despite our best efforts. And quite frankly, uh, I would say five years ago, I would have just said, well, it's, it is what it is. Uh, I know that surgery for this doesn't do anything. There's nothing we can do. Eventually, this patient will need an elbow to a transplant. But uh, things have changed. Uh, we tried uh, to do this, or I should say European investigators mostly, uh, in my trifar. Uh, study published in the England Journal, I will uh, show you in a moment, um, that showed that mitral flip in these patients doesn't do anything. 
Um, then the co-op trial came out and said, same patients, uh, you get the mitral clip, you will actually not just feel better, but live longer. And um, I'm hoping Dr. Azim Latip is on this call, who has a, a, a potpourri of uh, therapies uh, for the mitral valve that goes far beyond uh, the clip in appropriate patients. So to set the stage for uh, the next 20 minutes uh, of this lecture, I want to just say medical therapy uh, is amazing. Uh, CRT, ICD, I don't have time to speak about, but it's equally amazing, especially CRT in patients who are appropriate candidates. And then we have elevate transplant, which you know here at Montefiore, we love to do that uh, if the patients need it. Uh, our many thousands of patients, we hope they'll never need that, but we are ready to do it and we enjoy doing it if it is necessary. But there's a very big gap uh, between those therapies that we are uh, in, in conjunction with our structural uh, cardiologists uh, are trying to fill with uh, many things as I will show you now. So mitral regurgitation and heart failure, when does it matter? It's a very uh, simple answer. It matters when you are not able to make it go away with optimal medical therapy and uh, CRT as indicated. Um, so how do we treat persistent functional mitral regurgitation and heart failure in 2021? And I would say um, very much as a team, just like we treat, uh, you know, LVAT or transplant therapy or user, I should say. And we have uh, here at Montefiore expert uh, echocardiographers, uh, Edwin Ho uh, being one of them that will show us uh, exactly uh, what these valve, valves look like. Here's a mitral valve, including uh, 3D imaging. Uh, we have expert um, percutaneous valve therapists. I'm just going to make up this term. Here's uh, Dr. Latip, uh, who will uh, do anything to your valve that you have never even thought about. And then we have uh, a surgical team. And uh, these three faces I showed you are the core team for the structural heart disease team that will assess what is the best treatment for this patient. Medical therapy only. Uh, intervention on the valve by a cardiologist or uh, intervention on the valve by a surgeon and we will find the right therapy for patients. I want to emphasize that my uh, presentation focused on functional mitral regurgitation, the lipids are intact, the patient has degenerative MR uh, for the surgeon. Uh, you can call us too, we'd like to help, but the surgeons are really the most important people there. Um, I just want to recommend this review in circulation about two years ago uh, that really talks about uh, in depth about mitral regurgitation and what happens to the actual structure of the valve. It's a little beyond the scope of my presentation right now. But what you want to take away is there are two principal forces keeping the intact mitral valve sealed. Uh, and these are closing forces and tethering forces. And if there's any imbalance uh, between those two forces, the mitral valve uh, will leak. And if that's uh, too complicated, here's a perfectly uh, good uh, parachute device that uh, has caught the wind in the wrong way. This is, nothing's broken here, but you know that this is not uh, good. Uh, so how do we fix those things? How do we fix mitral regurgitation? I wanna briefly go over two trials that have tried to do this to answer the question, to clip or not to clip. The first uh, study is the MITRA FR study, 152 patients. This is published in the Journal of Medicine in 2018. They had MR three plus or more, despite optimal medical therapy, they got the clip or not. And then there was one year follow-up. These are typical uh, HEFREF patients. And bottom line was uh, no difference whatsoever in this uh, you know, fairly large trial for an initial therapy, 300 patients, and really overlap of the curve, so it's very disappointing. Um, when you look at serious uh, adverse events, of course, if you're in the control group and you had no intervention, you're not gonna have a, a study-related uh, serious adverse event, uh, but if you get the intervention and no benefit, that's not a good thing. So a very, very, very big disappointment in the MITRA. FR study. But soon thereafter, uh, only a few months later, actually, another trial was published. This is a co-op trial. And at first glance, very much the same, except uh, twice the number of patients, 600 patients, three plus MR despite optimal medical therapy, 
one-to-one -one randomization and somewhat longer follow-up, patient population, demographics, et cetera, newer class, all not uh, very different. But at the end of the two years, a dramatic difference uh, in the primary endpoint between the control group and the device group. And the primary endpoint, again, here was the total hospitalization for heart failure because it didn't think that this therapy could affect mortality. But when you look even on the right here uh, in the control group and the device group, in this trial, there was actually a very significant difference in all cause mortality. And you can see, you can eyeball this, this is about 15%. So you can do the math, treat seven patients, save one life. So this was a, a very rare situation where within six months, you had two New England Journal of Medicine papers, which completely opposing results investigating the same therapy. So how, uh, how can this be? And the explanation is here. Uh, the explanation is really in different definitions of severe mitral regurgitation. In the co-op trial on the left here, mitral regurgitation was defined as a regurgitant volume of at least 60 cc or an effective regurgitant office of more than 0.4 centimeter square. In the MITRA FR study, severe MR was defined as a regurgitant volume over 30 cc, so only half, and an ERO of over 0.2, again, only half. How can this be? Long explanation, different guidelines at the time in the United States and Europe, changing guidelines, but it is what it is. These were different inclusion criteria. And as a result, the patients that entered the co-op trial on the left here had a left ventricular end-diastolic volume of 190, whereas the mitral FR patients had a volume of 250 or so. So very different, much larger hearts in the mitral FR study. And when you look at the effective regurgitation volume, it was larger, not surprisingly, in co-op and lesser in mitral FR. So in the co-op study, we had patients who had smaller hearts and more MR compared to the mitral FR study. And this might be the explanation why uh, the co-op trial worked, but mitral FR not. There's a nice editorial here that was published about this that uh, coined this term of a pro a proportionate or disproportionate uh, mitral regurgitation. And in the co-op study, following this paradigm, patients had more MR than would be expected for the degree of dilation of the ventricles. And this exactly would be the therapeutic target, this extra MR. And that's when they, uh, that's why they would do better. To simplify this, uh, we published a review on this. This is my Shah, one of our former fellows, who's now at Jefferson. Uh, and basically the way we look at this from a clinician's perspective is you have a heart, you don't have much MR, the heart gets bigger, more MR, even bigger, more MR, yet bigger, more MR, and then very big and still more MR. And the optimal timing for intervention is when the heart is not just as big uh, as in mitral FR, but already has moderate to severe uh, mitral regurgitation. There are many other therapies uh, for the mitral valve now. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Latip will give a lecture on this or has already uh, during one of our upcoming uh, Monty Heart Lectures. But I want to spend uh, the last five minutes on something that we're pioneering here at Montefiore. And it's for patients who do not have uh, mitral regurgitation, but do have a dilated ventricle. And for background, uh, with all the enthusiasm that I shared with you about mitral clip in the co-op trial, it is very important to recognize, number one, intuitively, that patients in the co-op trial that did not get the device in blue continue to remodel. There is progressive remodeling. The heart gets larger and larger and larger, and then the patient dies, unless they are transplanted or they get an LVAD. And in the device group, you can see this is very much attenuated. So much less remodeling when we place uh, the mitral clip in these patients. But importantly, in the device group, in these patients, even if the mitral regurgitation goes away, 
the remodeling continues. And I hope you understand that if remodeling continues, the prognosis worsens. Maybe not as bad, but it's not good. We have not arrested uh, the disease process and that is our goal. So what is in the future? What attempts are in the future to really uh, prevent further remodeling? And I wanna give uh, maybe five more slides on the AccuSynch uh, device. And here I have to declare a conflict of interest uh, as I'm uh, one of the principal investigators and uh, as such may receive travel reimbursement to conferences, things like that, but no honorarium and no other interest. So this is ventriculoplasty, ventriculoplasty, not annuloplasty for mitral regurgitation, but ventriculoplasty for patients who do not have severe MR. And this is done to promote reverse remodeling uh, in patients without significant viral disease. And again, here's a picture of this uh, uh, device that I will show you in a minute how it's placed inside the heart with the goal to make the heart mechanically uh, smaller right away with a direct cinching about two centimeters below the mitral annulus. This will reduce left ventricular wall tension and stress and should promote uh, reverse remodeling, again, making the heart uh, smaller. Proof of concept for all of this was provided uh, by our surgical colleagues, uh, specifically in this study here, the RESTORE MV trial. Um, this is a trial where the heart is basically made smaller. You can see here, like we do from the inside with the AccuSynch, I just showed you from the outside. And this was really the only trial in the surgical arena uh, that showed or had a strong signal for improved survival and significant decrease in major adverse outcomes in patients that had their ventricle reshaped. Now, there are many caveats to this. Uh, one caveat is that they also had uh, other surgeries uh, that were done at the same time. But again, proof of concept provided uh, by the study to not drop uh, this intervention. Here at Montefiore, there is also a large history, as you may know, the STITCH trial that in a different way, tried to remodel the ventricle that overall was negative but there are certainly subgroups, which I personally believe in whom this surgery, surgical ventricular reconstruction is uh, successful. But let me stay uh, in the percutaneous arena and let me show how the AccuSynch uh, device is placed. And uh, Dr. Latip has already done this uh, several times here at Montefiore with good success. Um, you can now see uh, the left ventricle. Uh, soon we will come in with a catheter. Here you go through the aortic valve. You're looking at the mitral valve. Look uh, how far away from the mitral valve uh, this is placed. Anchors are placed in the wall, not to restrict the mitral annulus. This is an indirect effect, however, but to just make the heart uh, smaller. Oops, again, this is what this uh, device looks like. These are these anchors that go into the heart. This is what it looks like after placement into the heart. You can see here, it already begins to integrate right here and right here. And here is a uh, fluoroscopy done here at Montefiore on the first patient that we did. This is a swan against catheter right here. And then you can see this device now inside uh, the heart. Um, this shows you how the heart is made smaller. Initially, this device was on the purple line. Then after cinching it, uh, it pulls together uh, the left ventricle and reduces its di diameter acutely. Uh, there are some very preliminary data uh, that have been published at the TCT a year ago or so that shows that uh, reverse remodeling occurs. Um, I want to be very clear that this is an investigational device that um, we are conducting studies to test this, but I do want to share with you an anecdote. And I want to say it's an anecdote. It is one patient who is not blinded to anything that we treated here uh, in whom the ejection fraction improved from 40 to 50% after 30 days a significant improvement also in the six minute walk test. Again, this is unblinded registry. There's no control for it. 
But uh, if you have uh, advanced knowledge of echocardiography, you will know that global longitudinal strain uh, is an uh, indicator of remodeling of the heart, of stress on the heart. And in this particular patient, we had a very significant improvement uh, in global longitudinal strain from severely reduced to nearly normal after only 30 days. And this is nice data because this is something that uh, has nothing to do with how the patient feels or how we look at the echocardiogram and say, maybe it's 10% better. This is a fairly objective assessment of how quote unquote relaxed uh, the heart is. We are uh, taking this uh, to a global study. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that uh, two of the four um, leaders in this trial are from Montefiore, uh, Dr. Latip uh, and myself. This is a global study that has started. We actually randomized uh, the first patients at Montefiore. This is uh, the study diagram, I spare you the details, but after about 12 months, uh, we will have uh, some good uh, data. So in conclusion for today, uh, medical therapy of HEFRA has really dramatically evolved over the past two decades with very significant changes uh, in 2020, only a year ago. I've given a very similar lecture for about a decade uh, about ACE, ARB, beta blocker, and aldactone, and it really got very boring. But uh, hopefully today uh, you got the impression that it's not so boring anymore, at least not for the next few years when we implement this. And then uh, percutaneous device therapies promise to have very significant additional uh, clinical impact uh, in this field. So our challenge uh, is twofold. Number one, and this may be the bigger challenge because it affects the entire nation, so to speak, operationalize what we already know. That's our biggest problem, that we all have patients that are not treated the way I just showed you for one reason or another. Uh, and then uh, the other very strong message I wanna to give to you is we need to afford our patients the opportunity to participate in investigation and therapies. Uh, Corec, and Tresto, Dapaglifosin, CRT, Mitrocub, Elvet, they were all once investigational. And as I showed you in the beginning, only 20 years ago, if you presented to the office in class four heart failure, your one year survival was about 50%. And if you come to us today, uh, your one year survival is um, over 90%. And if you are still a candidate for um, heart replacement therapies, uh, at the end of your medical therapy journey, with many patients fail in the end, uh, you can live another 15 to 20 years with a heart transplant for an LVAD. The biggest issue is for us that these therapies are not utilized. And then when we get contacted for heart replacement therapy, it often is too late. So the big message today is we have a very big team now and uh, we um, try to give to the patients everything that is cutting edge, not just uh, with a knife, but uh, beginning with medical therapies. With that, thank you very much uh, for listening to me. And I think I hand it over to uh, Dr. Patel uh, to um, moderate, uh, look at chat and all of that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Yordi. That was an incredible lecture. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I think we can submit them through the chat and I can ask you. In the meantime, as we're waiting for some questions to come in, I have a couple of comments, uh, part comment, part question that, you know, I think as you illustrated really nicely for a long time, heart failure therapy was boring. We hadn't made any changes in the last couple of years. It's really an exciting place to be with new therapies, both pharmacologic and device. And when we had stagnated, the bar for treatment had changed a little bit, what was considered success in treatment. And we started looking at softer endpoints, heart failure hospitalizations, uh, six minute walk and other things. And I think the Victoria trial was really driven by non-mortality endpoints. Do you see in your practice that you would use a drug that is now FDA approved but does not have a mortality benefit, such as verisiglot? Um, I mean, I have to say, uh, I'm, I'm not as enthusiastic uh, 
about very cigarette um, because also it would be drug number five, I think. So first line, of course, uh, beta blocker and entresco doesn't matter in which sequence they are started. Uh, then, you know, mineralocorticoid antagonists, so now you have drug number three. Uh, then for sure, SGLT2 inhibitors. And once you get those drugs to appropriate doses, um, then, you know, there's a burden uh, on the patient. Uh, and I have to say, I don't really know whether uh, very cigarette uh, would have any benefit in patients who are already on uh, Entresto and, you know, whichever SGLT2 inhibitor is. So that would be um, the barrier. Now, there are patients who, for one reason or another, uh, cannot take these drugs. So, so, so you might, uh, of course, add it on. But I'm glad you asked that question because we do, this is also a question for us in device therapy trials. Um, you know, leading the uh, Atkinson's trial on the medical side, we have basically told all our investigators, even though SGLT2 inhibitors are not a class one recommendation yet, they will probably become a class one recommendation this year, okay. that we bas you basically cannot get into the Acrisense trial unless you're on Entresto or you have a good reason to it. And we really strongly encourage to have the patients on an SGLT2 inhibitor because we're not interested to find that a mechanical device can improve patients who were undertreated. And um, this is a little bit, um, uh, you know, why I'm not so enthusiastic about very Sigurd because I just don't know whether it would work in patients who already have Entresto and SGLT2 on board. Excellent. Um, I see that Dr. Mitchell is on and we have a couple of uh, questions to the chat, but since he's on, I think I'll uh, take advantage of his expertise here and put him on the spot a little bit. Uh, you know, he was one of the primary authors of the STITCH trial in ventricular reconstruction. And I think anybody that's taken care of a patient that's undergone it, uh, you know, we know the data that the overall primary endpoint was negative, but anecdotally, we've certainly seen some improvements. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, are there any uh, insights you can give into us of what patients you feel like respond to this better than others in your experience? Well, first of all, absolutely spectacular talk, uh, Uli. I learned a tremendous amount, as I always do when I'm in your audience. Um, the, the intriguing aspect of your uh, lecture towards the end reminded me of a lot of the issues that we grappled with in the... Um, in determining appropriate patients before the STITCH trial and then the lessons we learned from the STITCH trial. And I think there are, there are a number of overlapping points and they principally relate to patient selection and determining um, ventricular dimension and, and ventricular volume for the appropriateness of therapy, first of all. And then secondly, how are you determining in the study how, uh, how much volume to reduce or what dimensional reduction is the threshold reduction? Because what we learned from the STITCH trial is that there is indeed, and I actually uh, uh, published this in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery in a, in a, in a post hoc analysis, that there is a sweet spot for um, uh, surgical ventricular um, uh, reconstruction. And that sweet spot does provide a survival benefit and a heart failure free benefit. So how are you and your co-investigators determining those two factors, preoperative selection, first of all, and then how small do you make the ventricle? What's the percent reduction or the dimensional reduction that you're after? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really an amazing question. And that would probably be in, in the uh, primary endpoints for Accusin 2, if there ever, ever is such a study. But that's a key point, yeah. So we um, have excluded patients who have uh, a left ventricular end diastolic diameter over 8.5 centimeters for that particular reason, because we know that the heart may just too big. 
the um, anchor selection, you can place uh, up to 18 anchors. Usually it's around 16 in the heart. And then the cinch is uh, basically dictated by uh, the space between uh, those anchors. So there, with this specific technology, there is a certain range uh, of cinching. And to be perfectly honest with you, we don't know uh, the answer to this yet. In the very beginning, uh, the device was fully cinched, like maximally. And there were some issues with that in that it, it couldn't move properly, it couldn't relax enough. And then there were technical issues that arose from that. So that is not done anymore. Um, I mean, you kind of opened this up here. This is indeed a very crude approach to just make the heart a little bit smaller. If we can provide a proof of concept with this, then I think we would go you know, where you want to go. And this is exciting to say, this particular heart, we need to cinch this much. Um, what we're doing in this trial, it's 400 patients and 200, 400 patients, 200 of which get the device. All of these patients get a CT contrast uh, at the beginning and at one year. And a 3D model of the heart is built for each patient in the beginning and in the end. So there will be a wealth of information exactly to uh, the question that you wanna know the answer to. Uh, how much should we cinch in what patients is a certain shape of the heart not really amenable to cinching? Um, that will come in the future. Those are amazing questions. And that's, you know, in Stitch, uh, I, I know the paper that you mentioned and having been, you know, when I was at NYU almost 20 years ago, they were completely into uh, surgical ventricular reconstruction. And I've seen excellent anecdotal results. So uh, I do believe uh, that patient selection is everything for that surgery and in the future for uh, AccuSynch device or similar devices, if it works out. Thank you for a great question. Great. Um, I think that if we uh, kept you guys here for four hours, we could maybe solve this right now. Between the two <laughs> but I want to uh, move on and uh, we got to try to wrap this up quickly because we're already at one and it's a beautiful day out. But one question from Dr. Bukelich, who's one of our heart failure faculty, Millie, if you can unmute him. I think this is an important question. This is from uh, Dr. Madan. Uh, Dr. Vukulic. Uh, Dr. Vukulic. Okay, let me just quickly answer Dr. Madan was in the chat. I said that's an important question. Is ampaglifosin better than dapaglifosin or the other way around? Uh, that's a great question. It seems there's a clear class effect uh, in SGLT2 right now. Trials have exactly the same results and other drugs are in the pipeline uh, to do this. I also, since nobody asked, I do want to add that uh, the adverse event profile in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction of dapagliposin was exactly like the placebo, okay? So very little uh, side effects and ketoacidosis that is seen in type one diabetic patients is not seen in the heart failure patients. Okay, but Sasha, thank you uh, for uh, waiting. Well, I just wanna, wanna, wanna ask you, what is your approach of, uh, of using now in Trest or Arnis in a HFF patient or patients with minimally reduced ejection fraction, because I think that's a big uh, kind of controversy now based yeah. on uh, Paragon HF and the change in indications by FDA. Because okay. these are a big portion of our patients. We almost made it through this without talking about half -pep. So uh, <laughs> we're out of time. No, uh, quickly, uh, as Sasha, Dr. Vuklic is, is basically implying, Entresto was just approved for half -pep. Um, and the data to support that is okay, but really doesn't meet the usual requirements for approval. Um, it's almost a political question. Uh, I think that because we have no therapies for HFF, uh, I feel really good that uh, this drug is now a, a must. So we can we'll soon enter the guidelines and we can finally begin to lay out the uh, treatment paradigm pharmacology in HFF, starting with Entresto. So I think it should be the first line drug uh, uh, in anybody you would otherwise give an ACE or an ARB to, for which there's no evidence whatsoever that they work in HFF. So in that sense, it's the first aldactone, right? And then uh, spironolactone and then Entresto. I, th I think I would give it. Okay, um, one last uh, question in the chat and then we can wrap it up. Uh, 
This comes from Dr. Dmitry Belov, who's the chief of heart failure at Albany Medical Center, one of our former fellows. Fellows, he says, Dr. Yorty, thank you for your comprehensive, fantastic talk. How often do you encounter patients who are intolerant to Entresto due to hypotension? Yeah, great question, Dimitri. Thanks, great. Thanks for joining um, from Albany. Um, at the initiation of uh, Entresto, uh, because of it's also a little bit diuretic effect, uh, we usually cut uh, diuretics in half. Uh, and in that setting, um, you know, not that frequently. Uh, in the beginning, I have to say, I saw it a couple of times because I didn't know what to do and just continued the diuretic and then they come back hypotensive. Uh, but I'd say somebody with systolic blood pressure above 100 uh, in whom the diuretic is reduced in half and you start with the lowest dose, um, in most, most patients, uh, it will be okay. Uh, that's again, that's the one time where I'm, I'm concerned about that. I would first give them, uh, 12.5 milligrams of prosatan just to see how they do with, uh, with a RAS blocker. All right. That's excellent insight. And I think with that, we'll wrap it up. Uh, thanks again, Uli, for a fantastic talk. Great, and, uh, thank you.